everybody, welcome back to Great Northwest Weaponry. This is Thomas, and today we're taking a look at what in the past we have called the Bad Mustache Man Youth Knife. We're gonna actually use the name here, it is the Hitler Youth Knife, or Hitler Youth Dagger. This is probably gonna be the most likely episode to get me a strike so far from YouTube, as pretty much every bit of history that we're gonna be talking about here involves the words Hitler and Nazi. So I'm going to make it very clear right up front here, I am not condoning or supporting Nazi ideology. If you think I am, or if you do, feel free to get out of my comment section um, and, you know, not watch the remainder of the video, because that is not what this is about. We're talking about the history of a piece of weaponry. These are fairly common on the United States collector's market. Pretty much anything with a swastika on it was a prime candidate for being a bring back by US soldiers stationed in Europe. We're gonna start with a brief history of the Hitler Youth Organization or in their language, Hitler Jugend. I will be throwing around a lot of German words throughout the course of this video. Forgive my pronunciation, I am trying. I'm actually trying to learn the language. I've been working on this for a little while because I'm hoping by my 30th birthday, about a year and a half from now, to visit Central Europe. And knowing German would be quite useful. Though, from what I've understood, you'll find enough English speakers in the majority of Europe that you can make your way around. But it'd be nice to, to you know, have that bilingual ability. So, I am trying, and I do know a bit about German pronunciations, but some of these words are monstrous. For instance, uh, the Hitler Youth themselves. Their official name, designated in July of 1926, was the Hitler Jugendbund Deutscher Arbeiterjugend. This translates directly to Hitler Youth League of German Worker Youth. Kind of a redundant name. It would start out very small, as the uh, Nazi movement, you know, was not the uh, the King Puba of uh, of national movements in Germany for quite some time, but. By the end, you know, uh, 1940s, it was the only youth organization in all of Germany, and joining was mandatory if you were between the ages of 14 and 18. So again, these are boys. Uh, an 18-year-old, you know, is, is legally considered an adult, but 28-year-old me, looking back at 18-year-old me, like, I would not consider 18-year-old me to have been a man. I'm not going to speak for you, but... 18 year olds are teenagers like a teenager is a teenager is a teenager these are teenagers for all intents and purposes they're boys they could be as young as 12 um even younger I, I believe but 14 to 18 it was mandatory to join and this basically was uh, almost an allegory for uh, like american boy scouts a lot heavier on the political indoctrination side especially the farther into the war you get it was essentially a paramilitary group and would be used as such in a couple of circumstances. Uh, during the fall of Berlin is a particular instance where it got really nasty, but in 1943, there's an example where a group of boys aged 16 to 17, uh, all born in the year 1926, were organized into a Waffen-SS division and sent into occupied France, where they committed a number of atrocities by my understanding this group uh, was res directly responsible for, or at least participated in, the massacre of Canadian prisoners of war. So it's a very dark history. Like, if you know anything about the HJ organization, you, you know it's dark. And doing the research for this, I definitely lost a little bit more of, of what precious little faith I have left in humanity. So... Uh, it, it it's depressing stuff to read about. Uh, less depressing is the, what in English sounds hilarious, name of this knife. Generally speaking, Hitler Youth Boys would be very excited to get their hands on the Farthenmesser. No, I'm not kidding. That is what they're called. It translates to sheath knife. In English, it's... It's fart and messer. Like, I, I I can't make that sound less bad. I'm sure there's a more correct way to pronounce it, but F-A-H-R-T-E-N-M-E-S-S-E-R. Fart and messer. 
Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to get away from that before I just start giggling because the my very juvenile sense of humor just, just can't get past that name. Uh, but that would be the knife seen before us here. Like most German equipment of the Second World War, these would go through a lot of different iterations over the course of the war. A lot of changes to them would be made. There are a couple of things that are seen through pretty much all examples of these, such as the uh, the Hitler Youth diamond with swastika in the middle. And again, that is one thing that very much marked it out for being seized by uh, trophy seekers around the end of the Second World War amongst United States enlisted men. There would be a ton of these floating around. I don't know the exact percentage of them that, that were actually issued out to Hitler Youth recruits, but the Hitler Youth itself, by 1940, exceeded 8 million. Uh, I think it was in 1936, it was something like 60% of all eligible aged males were members. It, um, it was not a small deal. And again, the number is skewed because for the majority of this time that it was active, it was the only legitimate boys' youth organization in Germany. And again, the later you get into the war, it became mandatory to join ages 14 to 18 once again. That's about all that we're going to talk about the actual history of the Hitler Youth itself, because this is more about the knife. And a lot of this we're going to be looking tabletop and talking about markings. Markings on these can be kind of hard to decipher. You're going to want to find a chart to figure out specifically which model yours is, like who made it specifically. Uh, I actually found a really good one, and I'm going to link it in the video description before we go into the uh the tabletop view just wanted to make sure and bring that up because there were I, I think it was like 120 different codes for these but yeah i think that's what we're going to do now we're going to go to the tabletop and we're going to talk about how the knife changed over the course of its production which uh just worth noting here ran from about 1933 to 1942 so anyway tabletop here we go Okay, let's go over how this knife evolved over the course of its production. From my understanding, production kicked off in 1933. From 1933 to 1936 seems to be what is typically considered the early examples. These would feature little to no ricasso. That's this flat part on the blade that is thick all the way through. It'll be about the same width of the spine of the blade all the way through, no edge. Again, or the early... 33 to 36 examples would have little to none of that, as well as nickel silver fittings, anodized scabbards. The Hitler Youth motto would be on the right side of the blade, I believe. This would be Blut und Ehre, or Blood and Honor. This is spelled B L U T space U N D space E H R E with an exclamation point, and it would be scrolled in cursive along the blade. By 1936, you start seeing what are often called transitional models. These would be uh, just when features started changing, basically. So the Ricasso would start getting deeper and more present, if it you know was at all on the earlier examples. The scabbards would often start being painted, and the later you get, the lower the quality of leather on the strap. The very late examples, 1940 to 1942, the strap can even sometimes be seen as being like a cheap plastic. But typically, as you get later, the leather is of lower quality. The Ricasso is deeper. In these transitional examples also is when you'll start seeing the maker's marks and names replaced with these codes. I don't know how well you can see that. This blade is pretty dark but it would be an RZM code. So there's an RZM in a circle, and then on this example, M7 slash 51, and then a little space, and 39. 39 is the date that this example was made. M7 slash 51 denotes the maker in this particular example. That is an Anton Wingen Jr. of Solingen. 
Again, there are a ton of different makers and a ton of different codes. I'll be posting a link to a good chart of these that I found, but that is my example. And they seem to run from M7 slash one through M7 slash one something, like 100 and something. And then there are some that are, are uh, larger, less comprehensible series of letters and or numbers, but most of them seem to be the M7 slash and then series of numbers and those each denote a different factory. The blades would become thicker as time went on, the thickest typically being the latest, the 1940 to 42 examples. Pretty much everything would be cheaper methods and materials than earlier examples. Now there is a stamp that I'm not certain what it is, and if you do know, I would like to hear from you in the comments section. There's this stamp, I don't know if you can see it again, but it appears to be a soldier standing upright, feet on this side of the Ricasso, head on this side. I can't find a definitive answer on what that is. Another thing that you'll notice is most of these seem to have been sharpened, and it seems like it happened a long time ago. That is because the Hitler Youth member himself, who this was issued to, would often put a better edge on them themselves. These were typically issued fairly dull. They weren't edgeless, but they were rather dull. Not, not really sharp enough to do any serious work with. Again, as you get later, you will notice, basically starting in 1939, which this example is, that the motto is no longer present, the Blut und Ehre. And that, I think, will about wrap it up for today. Hope you all enjoyed the video. It's been Thomas Great Northwest Weaponry, and we'll see you next time.